Welcome to our Wagner Lab Cafe online. And thanks a lot that so many people are interested in this educational topic. My name is Alexander Biller, and I'm looking forward to share a lot of inspiration with you. Um, our topic today, School of the Future, best practice around the world, and how does learning basics uh, look like in which we teach and learn in the future? Which space concepts fit the education of tomorrow and the teaching of 21st century skills? New pedagogical and didactic concepts demand new room concepts. A confidential corridor school is a discontinued model. Together, we will learn more about inspiring solutions for the educational building of tomorrow and discover how we can optimally combine pedagogy and space. And we have fantastic speaker today, which will share a lot of insights and know-how with us. Impasse number one is about what are the success factors for new school with Thomas Lakwa, founder and managing director of Wonder Labs, a company specializing in the transformation of education and future learning architectures, clients including Fluid Otto, Henkel and the Louis Nunn Foundation, the recipient of the German Design Award, Red Dot Design Award and EF Design Award, member of the executive board of the Plus Mint Talentförderung Association and ambassador for the House der Kleinen Forscher Foundation. So I'm very happy that you're on board, Thomas. Impulse number two is focusing on the question why does the learning environment matter in fostering expert learners? With Rachel Naslan, well AP research analyst at LPA Design Studios from the US. Rachel is an environmental psychologist trained to examine the interplay between human behavior and the natural built environment. As a design researcher and strategist at LPA Design Studio, Rachel uses a mixed method approach to help inform design decisions related to human experience, health, and wellness, community impact, and sustainable design performance. So Rachel, it's an honor that you're on board. And impulse number three is about how can we transform schools to refine and reshape as a pedagogy and technology evolve with Mariana Lavezzo, Lead AP, Director of School Planning at LPA Design Studios. And Mariana has worked with educators around the world to plan and develop school facilities that empower students and reflect their communities. As a planner and designer, she fosters a collaborative, research-driven approach that makes sustainability, equity, and wellness a core part of the design process. So Mariana, I'm very happy that you're on board, on board and I'm looking forward to your slides. At the end, we have a Q&A session. Um, so if you have questions, please write it in the chat and we will answer them. And then I would say, let's start. Le let's learn more from the educational professionals. Take a good cup of coffee in the morning in the US or here in the evening. In, in Europe and be inspired. So Thomas, it's your turn. And a warm welcome from me. My name is Thomas Lacroix and I'm a member of the transformation team in Luis Lund. I'd like to give you some insights into our experiences over the past five years uh, and explain the fundamental changes that have been taking place at our private boarding school. Here you can see the little harbor at the campus in Luis Lund, the cutter that the children use for research trips to investigate the Baltic Sea's microplastic content is visible in the background. The stately home was built in 1772 as a summer residence for Landgrave Karl von Hessen Kassel and his wife Louise. It has been home to the Louise Lund Foundation and various types of school since 1949. The foundation organizes the framework for the accommodation and education of currently around 490 German and international students. 
uh, our educational portfolio includes the primary school, the state approved all day secondary school, the plus STEM talent center and the IB World School. We have more than 320 students living here on the campus in the various boarding school facilities. Some 170 young people from the surrounding region, mainly primary and junior level students, uh, joined the Louis and Lund community every morning as day students. So that was a short introduction to the Louis and Lund Foundation. Now I'd like to address the question of what are the success factors for ambitious new schools? We are all part of a radical and global change process. I believe it is essential to move away from traditional education concepts and structures, rather than aiming to maintain the status quo in the future, we should be embracing the changing circumstances of living on this planet as a challenge. We have arrived at a turning point after reaching the end of an epoch characterized by prosperity and growth. COVID-19, wars, climate change, biodiversity, migration, digital transformation, mobility, and demographics are examples of the dimension of changes taking place. Schools should not simulate a reality that no longer exists. Our approach to dealing with trends, insecurity, complexity, and ambiguity will, to a great extent, determine the younger generation's future. Everything is interconnected. Before we can initiate a change process, we need to we need the broad approval and support for everyone involved. The changes not only affect the way students learn, but also the role of the teachers and the general approach to collaborative working. After extensive discussion, we decided to reject the concept of homogeneity as, as the uh, organizational basis of our schools in Luisenlund. Today, the heterogeneity of our school community is affecting our thinking and increasingly changing the process we use to structure our schools and our collaborative practices. We are gradually phasing out existing lesson structures such as classroom learning and school years and replacing them with other structuring elements. In the future, besides subject requirements and transparent grades, we will be focusing on individual course plans for each student with appropriate content, time and learning environments. This will enable us to create a learning climate based on care, empathy, engagement, respect, and commitment. We want to ensure that the competence-oriented lessons in Louise Lund are consistently oriented on student learning practices. And that means the students being aware of what they should have learned by the end of each teaching unit. They will know the learning steps to be taken and why it's so important to learn about a specific subject. This is obviously a highly nuanced and evolutionary process that is differently structured at primary school level and lower secondary level. Again, the approach taken at the higher secondary level is different to that taken at the Ivy World School. Each student will be the architect of their own development and learning progress in Louise Lund. With our support systems, we have various means of helping them to achieve this goal. 
All these different ways of learning in Louise and Lund necessitate flex flexible learning situations and adaptable learning environments in our teaching buildings. Soon, there will be no more traditional classrooms here. Both the stately home and the grounds are historic environments with limitations on their practical further development as an educational setting. For that reason, we knew that we wanted to create new learning spaces that would be suitable to all facets of individual learning. That includes learning in large groups, cooperative learning in small groups, and also independent learning with feedback. The day and boarding school in Louise Lund is a place that facilitates success rather than documenting failure. Our new school building for the upper secondary students and the IB World School students is representative of it. Here is an illustration of it. And here is a photo with the current state of construction. We will move in there in approximately two weeks. Our new learning space concepts and open plan learning areas support the younger and older children in the lower levels with age appropriate learning through play. They also support deep learning for upper secondary students. In other words, the, student, the students can autonomously structure their learning activities and familiarize themselves with creativity, critical thinking, collaboration, and communication. We facilitate that with various coordinated learning environments that make different ways of working possible. We have a digital learning platform and we use the flipped classroom concept. And we naturally have rooms that can be adapted for use for different purposes or support interdisciplinary teaching methods. Here you can see an open plan learning area with our new flex rooms with acoustic curtains. In Louise Lund, science lessons always take place in blocks. The students spend a whole week in the open plan laboratory where they work independently with the support of the teachers. Here's a recent, a recent photo from the future STEM space. You see, we are in process of moving in. So what are the success factors for schools with sustainable futures? The courage to fundamentally question existing systems. Understanding that heterogeneity is fundamental for schooling, switching the focus back to learning, understanding ourselves as a part of the change process, bringing research and reality back into school, transferring responsibility to the students, allowing teachers to grow into their new role, and facilitating flexible and open plan learning spaces. Thank you for your time. Thanks a lot, Thomas, for this exciting insights and live photos on, on site. And uh, we are looking forward um, when the, the school is starting. Um, so I have a first question to you. And um, what were the biggest challenges you faced during the change process in Louis Lund? I think, um, especially for the teacher, it's 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 a big step, uh, the the new learning environment, and also the yeah the the new possibilities, and also the method of teaching or or um, coaching uh, the coaching model. What were the biggest challenges in your mind? The biggest challenge is uh, giving people psychological security during the change process. There are many different uh, interests and viewpoints. In particular, it is important to remember 
that not all people consider themselves to be a part of the change process. Uh, we can't force anyone, but in that case, we should part ways. Okay, thanks a lot. Then I would say I directly hand over to our next speaker, Rachel. It's your, it's your turn. Hello, everyone. I am going to talk about why the learning environment matters in fostering expert learners. In, so first, I feel like we need to address what an expert learner is. In a fast evolving job market, it's hard to predict future jobs. The future job market will likely be automated. And it's likely that students will have multiple jobs in their, life their lifespan compared to earlier generations that grew up um, within roles in companies. So we need to develop students' love of learning to keep up with the fast growing and changing workforce. And we need to build that intrinsic motivation for students to love that learning. We've done the research and space design has an impact on our behavior. It impacts student learning progress towards educational goals, influencing behavior mindsets and engagement. Good space design can celebrate the learner variability and promote student belongingness. So we need to also understand how the brain works and retains new information. The brain learns best when it's calm and not distracted. This allows that reflective and cognitive part of the brain to think, process, and learn. So we need to ensure that the environment communicates safety and comfort to learners to avoid activating that flight or fight response that happens when we feel unsafe, uncomfortable, or out of place. With that reactive brain in check, you can shift your attention to learning and be engaged in the novel, relevant, and emotive. In order to reach the end goal of learning, we need to think about designing space through a student's perspective. If we first want to calm the brain and then pique students' interest to maintain engagement and encouragement, encourage deeper learning and innovation, we want the environment to cue these behaviors. The first step is to cultivate a sense of belonging through a welcoming environment that is scaled to early learners. This will allow them to relax and feel safe so that the learning can take place. And then you wanna provide an engaging space that facilitates a range of opportunities for hands-on learning and collaboration. You wanna extend the learning um, experiences to include solving real world problems and have the environment connect to the local community so students can relate and understand the context of what they're learning. And then ultimately, um, the environment should encourage play and exploration. We want to foster this idea that learning can happen anywhere. Passion for learning happens when students can follow their interests and create ideas that are uniquely their own. We need to dissolve this line that's been drawn between learning and play. As I mentioned, research um, links the brain to the environmental input around us to create an identity safe space. You want it to be welcoming for all learners and relatable for students of many different backgrounds. The school's built environment can contribute to the development of students um, identity as a learner in that space and a member of that learning community. So the curation of the classroom should reflect students world and the learning spaces need to be culturally responsive and brain friendly with agency and choices for them. Not all students learn the same. And so agency can really help, especially those sensitive students, author their own level of engagement to maintain a sense of safety, which allows them to remain focused for the lesson, the duration of the lessons. And with so many strategies of thinking and learning, research shows that students are more engaged in their learning when they're actively doing, moving, and interacting with the material hands-on experience there. The environment's ability to support this hands-on experience, it does sustain students' engagement for longer than, than the traditional methods of um, passive learning where teachers instruct and students are expected to listen and, and memorize information. In these environments, we want students to experiment and explore the applications. And while that passive learning style um, may be easier to administer for teachers, it doesn't favor our brain activity. We want the active learning to be um, participatory because it changes the way that the brain works and accelerates students' learning process. 
Now we're gonna talk about how place is more than just a physical space. Space alone is just a physical environment defined by those built and natural structures that are within it. However, when you add that ever-changing component of people that occupy the space and they live and learn, socialize in it, then there becomes associated meanings with it and attachments that form. And this is what creates a place. The importance of these attached meanings create these intangible feelings of significance in that, in that place. It supports belonging through a connection to the others who use the space a sense of safety and security, and it reflects the identity of those who use it. So designers can never fully anticipate how a space is going to be used because it's those users who apply that meaning. And it's always based on their own experiences, their lived experiences. So we won't always anticipate um, exactly how a space is to be used, which is why we need to make it flexible and allow many choices. Place attachment theory highlights this bond between the people and place. These emotional connections are part of human nature and it reflects our innate desire to find meaning and belonging, which is necessary for identity formation and critical to students' social, emotional, and educational development. Place attachment theory shows that people are most attached to their favorite places and those favorite places tend to be spaces that are out in nature and outdoor spaces, um, since that's something that humans instinctually bond with. Um, it tends to also relate to be, it also tends to be health forward and restorative environments that make people feel good from the inside out, and also environments that inspire novelty and independence. People wanna be able to feel like they can put their mark in the environment and make it their own. So as you'll see in this image, or these images, we wanna embrace ambiguity and support students' authorship of their space. During these formative years of identity formation, it's vital for students to be able to test their bounds and act within the environment. When the space is less prescriptive, students will use it in creative ways and accommodate their physical and cognitive needs for learning. So it doesn't need to make sense for us, it needs to make sense for them. And you can see in these pictures, the student lying on the floor, that's providing a tactile stimulation, which she might need to be able to engage in the um, activity. The students huddle, huddle, huddling under a desk is providing that need for belonging and safety and security, feeling like they're with others in a protected place. So this allows students to feel comfortable in their space so that they can engage more with the lesson. There has also been a clear drawn line between play and learning, as I mentioned, but play is healthy for foundational social and emotional function. And it's been found that increase in recess or play outside causes an increase in student attention span and instructional time. Play is also associated with increased dopamine levels, which is the happy hormone that we feel and that's linked to enhanced memory, attention, creativity, and intrinsic motivation, which we talked about being super important for expert learners. Um, similarly, outdoor learning has also, also benefits brain development because nature-based learning improves motor skills, provides diverse sensory experiences, and supports creativity and imagination. During the early developmental stages, research points to the importance of engaging um, children's senses. Children learn by experiencing their world through all of their senses and exploring it with their bodies. So spaces that offer rich landscape, um, spaces that offer yeah, rich landscape of sensory elements um, allows for more personalization of the experience for them. So you can have sensory zones with different levels of noise, uh, textures, lighting, levels, colors, smells, and sounds. But young children engage in this sensory exploration to learn about the world around them. It provides that tactile experience that signals messages to them that the space is either good or bad, it's safe or not, 
Um, so if something has rough textures, students want to learn that, okay, that's not somewhere I want to go versus home to your spaces where they want to, they feel comfortable and safe. A learning environment, um, it should be designed to also address the student's size. Um, that's especially important for the early learners, the younger learners, what a child can reach and have agency over directly impacts their developing sense of independence. So we want to encourage them to be able to make that space their own and reach things they can engage in learning on their own and don't require assistance from instructors. And then also providing those nooks and alcoves allows for opportunities for that refuge and exploration. And then we want to, now that all the students feel safe and like they belong in a comfortable space, we want to engage the students where they're at. And this requires an understanding of students' development through K-12 and the environment's role in facilitating these developmental stages so that students properly develop their interpersonal skills, which directly relates to learning readiness. Students in preschool are at the age of active engagement, which focuses on body movement, um, social emotional interaction, and experiential learning. It's important for the environment to nurture curiosity um, and student-led learning opportunities for observation, experimentation, and discovery. Elementary school students are working on assertiveness, seeking opportunities for self-expression, leadership, and decision-making. The environment should be open-ended more so than prescriptive, so that it encourages students to build that autonomy, self-efficacy, and discover their own passions. And for middle school students, the environment should inspire the cross-disciplinary thinking and peer interactions to attend to their developmental need for, de for belonging and connection to other students. So that's really where they're looking to their peers to understand themselves a little bit more. So we want to encourage that with more peer spaces. And then lastly, at the stage of reflection, high school students have developed increasing cognitive maturity. And so um, their focus begins to shift on finding a deeper meaning in their environment, and it shifts away from that sensory engagement to more cognitive engagement with the world um, to help them foster self-identity, their sense of responsibility in the world, and critical thinking. But they're doing more of that abstract thinking of analyzing and providing insights to the context that they're learning. But schools have not been designed for all children to access in the past. And the goal of these future schools is to reduce the disabilities in both the curriculum and the environment. So more students can become expert learners. Universal design for learning aims to meet all students where they're at and considers students at different points in the developmental continuum. Um, when creating learning spaces for students, it's critical that the environment responds to students' needs and nurtures their mind, body, and spirit. By providing a variety of spaces that allow for each learning style, we can assure that um, there's a space that meets every student's needs and where they can learn best. There's so many different learning styles that learning spaces must support multiple learning modalities. So for example, you have breakout groups and social learning activities for more to support more of those verbal learners. You can have writable services and manipulable furniture to support um, more visual and spatial learners who are likely pretty good at visualizing the world in 3D. Some other examples would be some flexible movable furniture with different seating and standing options to support the kinesthetic um, learners and also acoustical chairs or other furniture that supports auditory musical learners who like to pair music and dance with learning. So create, allowing all these different learning styles to be within the environment is super important. Neurodiversity, which considers um, all of the different ways that students learn, and it, it focuses on the variances in human thinking and how people process information differently. Children's brains process sensory information from the environment and interpret that um, sensation from the world around them to respond to. So a well-designed neurospace attends to 
does sensory response and acknowledges the range of neurodiversity that could be within a classroom. So in the images, you can see a range of stimulation for students, opportunities to move and change posture, micro environments to support social interaction, different furniture options um, that anchor students where they are and opportunities for privacy within a larger space. And then we also wanna design from the body. So the body is a learning tool, which we often restrict in schools. We tell students to sit still and be quiet. Um, but students use their body to explore space and learn what the space affords. And movement in itself helps the brain learn whether it's small fidgeting movements, which stimulates neurons in the brain to help students stay attentive, or larger movements that allow students to connect concepts to action and learn through cause and effect. The design needs to support this natural inclination for movement around the learning space. And research has shown that children acquire knowledge by acting and then reflecting on their experiences. So this builds impulse control, self-regulation, and executive functioning skills, which are found foundational for academic readiness. The space can encourage this type of movement by allowing opportunities for exploration, um, allowing opportunities for risk taking, offering furniture that enables body movement and incorporate it into the lesson plan. And then lastly, to make sure that we're designing for the spirit, we want to make sure that we're um, we're helping students, we're meeting students with their social emotional needs. So by providing a variety of spaces that allow for different personality traits, we can ensure that this, that there is a space where every student can feel comfortable and welcome. Um, respite seating can support more solitary intrapersonal learners who like to internalize material while more collaborative zones and places to gather support those social learners who easily connect with others and want to talk through their ideas. Um, and these group and individual spaces can be enclosed or become a breakout zone within a larger space as you see in these images. And they're defined by the furniture and the materials, but there's many levels of privacy and engagement in space and students can either want to be by themselves, but among others, or they may want to be in a group of others and be private. So we need to make sure that spaces accommodate all types of interactions. And studies have shown that, um, that spaces for privacy are just as important. So to promote health and well-being of the whole student, um, we need to ensure that there's restorative and gathering spaces available within the learning environment. Thank you. Rachel, thanks a lot for this psychological insights and this beautiful pictures. Normally, when you are going into a school, it's it's like a prison, and and uh, the students are asking, when can we go out? And and here in this place, um, that's so lovely. Uh, I think they will never go out. They they love this space. So uh, really really cool pictures, and and thanks a lot. And in yeah in 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 your mind and. Or what is your opinion? How does space support students' love for learning most? What are the, the, the most important factors, in your opinion? I think we, something we don't talk about enough is the culture of the school and how the environment um, communicates that culture to students. If, if the culture is right and it's built around belonging and engagement, students will flourish. And so the spatial design elements um, can kind of define that that learning climate for for agency student agency and I think that's probably one of the biggest things is allowing students to have choices and exercise their um, exercise their agency over a space will allow them to feel like they're making it their own and so right there that allows them to feel like they're belonging in it. Okay, thank you. So I hand over to. The third impulse today to Mariana. Mariana, it's your turn. Great, thank you. All right, so uh, following uh, Rachel, I'm going to be just sharing some images and examples of how we can transform schools because really 
Uh, there are a lot of schools in the world that are still built based on the factory model of just um, delivering education mostly in the lecture mode um, for students to take in and memorize and take the exam, but we're all wanting to uh, really prepare students for the future. So th there's so many um, buildings that are outdated. So I'll focus more on uh, what we can do um, to make schools more future ready. So um, one of the most important things is having this connectivity um, instead of classrooms being boxes that are each isolated and the teachers are working in silos and the students are also working in silos. It's really about this dissolving of boundaries between the spaces. Um, so that can empower students to have that choice that Rachel was talking about. You have the choice to go where you need to go to do the activity that you need to do to learn best. And so um, another model is like on the bottom right image, having learning suites where it's um, maybe a room that has transparency to this commons area just outside of it, but also with some small group rooms that are used for small group collaboration or you know very multi-purpose. So the idea is now, um, I agree with Thomas that one day we probably won't have classrooms the way we have them now. And we're already starting to do that by extending the footprint of the classroom to the indoors and the outdoors. So now as a teacher, I am able to facilitate different styles of learning because I can still supervise my students that are just outside or just inside. And so we're also, um, as we know, you learn better when you can apply the learning. And so the inquiry-based um, learning model really relies on um, student-centeredness. So empowering students to see what questions they have, what it is they want to learn, and learning how to get to the answer, how to go through the process. Um, it really developing their learning skills so they can just learn anything, right? Our old um, school model is based on learning some very specific things. Um, even our career tech education um, used to be about learning a vocation so that you can go and do that vocation. And that's evolved into more of applied learning and um, learning something uh, where you can transfer the skills to something else, not training to be some specific um, vocation. And so in this model, the, you know, the third thing that's really important is where the teacher um, becomes a facilitator of learning, um, really working side by side with the students and just support it, kind of getting out of the way and letting them um, keep that curiosity that they're born with and learn through exploration and really you know, emphasizing conceptual learning. So I just put the, you know, the inquiry-based learning cycle is your first asking, then you're going to investigate. There's many different ways to investigate. Then you're going to create something um, to see if that's the answer. You'll share it with others. Uh, you'll probably need to go back and reflect and go back. So it's a cycle. And so this diagram is a floor plan just showing how um, if you rethink a building, like this could have been a double loaded corridor with, you know, building with the corridor going down the middle here, but then you can, you know, Re redesign it differently so that you have all the spaces that are perfect for supporting this inquiry-based cycle. You know, so we can start. Um, we can start here. You know, maybe there's a little bit of lecture-based kickoff by the teacher, um, not in the old way where you know we're doing a, a biology experiment and the teacher is telling us here are the ten steps you have to do, do them, and then turn in your assignment. Right? It's more. Um, kicking off something in conceptual learning, um, and then students can go off and, and they have the space um, to do research, um, to create something and prototype it, uh, come together and work in small groups, uh, maybe go and focus and present what they're working on, um, a separate space um, to build something. And so these images are showing again, this, you know, this is not your grandmother's school, right? It isn't a double loaded corridor with um, classrooms on both sides, but this one is more um, an open plan, kind of like Thomas was sharing, where you have these different zones um, where you can do all these steps that you need to become an expert learner and engage in, in, in an inquiry-based learning process. 
<clears throat> so I think really what probably needs to stay enclosed is say the lab here where it's something um, messy and it's making dust and you need all the right equipment and it's noisy. Um, that makes sense, but there's really a lot you can do in a well-designed open plan that has a very you know, clear zones and good enhanced acoustics so that multiple learning activities can happen at the same time and students are able to focus. Um, another part of this is when you're doing something that's very active, like a maker space, um, there's going to be a nice buzz of noise and it doesn't matter because every student is so engaged in what they're doing. Um, they're on, they're on task. And so here, just kind of using this photograph as a diagram, you can see again, this space is where these students are going to use technology to upload content to share with each other. Um, and that's another big shift from the traditional where the technology isn't just that smart board that we still see in a lot of schools where that's really designed for the teacher to be at the front lecturing to the students, but there's fluid technology that's throughout the space that is really for the students to use as part of um, their learning. Um, then smaller individual settings where groups can break out um, again, a teaching area over here with mobile whiteboard, again, for the students. So you can see this isn't all based for a teacher to be delivering to students. Everybody is engaged and has a different place to go for what they need to do in that moment of an inquiry-based learning cycle. Um, standing tables are great too, uh, so that students can be um, engaged and often um, teachers are working with students and instead of bending down to a lower desk, they can uh, get together at a standing table. Um, and then just space to just be, um, space where you, you need to get away from what you're doing and get into that more diffuse thinking. Um, so a space where you can just um, connect with each other and huddle or even be alone. Um, and then a zone here that's more for the messy work of prototyping ideas and building. And so here's again another, um, you know, a drawing and imagery that shows um, a place where there, again, it's divided by zones and you're free. You have this freedom to move to where you need to go to do uh, whatever you're working on in that moment. So here's a more um, quiet zone with a connection to nature. Um, this, these are um, classrooms here, but they have transparency to the outside, so students are free to take more ownership of their learning and go out to the commons and work out there, or simply um, connect with each other. And then still having some spaces that are um, kind of designed for a lecture-based a lecture -based mode um, to begin something or access technology. And so shifting to talking about uh, future planning, it's really all about um, planning spaces that are going to support real world scenarios and career aspirations. So anything that's applied learning, um, in America, we call it career tech education, but we're getting away from that term because it connotes um, the programs that are for you know, students that will never go to college, they need to just have a vocation. Um, instead, this is something that we're now rolling out, even sometimes starting in elementary school, exposing kids to um, science, technology, engineering, things like that. But in middle schools, there's programs where in one semester, they get to try um, like four different careers by, by, by doing some hands-on learning. And so um, the challenge I feel is that we don't know what careers are going to exist in the future. There are many more that we don't even know about. So all these spaces are great in that they're supporting, um, you know, simulating a professional environment as much as possible. Um, this one is really um, a space where they can do a lot of experimentation in general, but we need to plan these spaces in a way that's flexible for now to use them flexibly, but also for the future to know that this, this whole room might need to completely change because it's going to be for a different career. And so here again, um, more examples. I think one um, direction that K-12 is shifting in is taking this approach uh, that we take um, for when we do tenant improvement for businesses where we use this raised access flooring 
uh, especially if you have like a multiple story building. And that allows you to move the power and data around. Um, you could do it from semester to semester if one teacher is working in one way that's different or a different subject than another. You have that flexibility, flexibility today and it's an investment. Of course, it's gonna cost more than not doing a raised access floor, but you will save money down the line because you have this flexibility for to you know have the building evolve with how um, careers evolve. And so here, you know, they can adapt and reconfigure the space now as it is, but this is a, a very um, powerful move to adapt it in the future as well. And really, you know, having things um, that are done like power reels from the, the ceiling here and other technology in the ceiling. So everything down on the floor can move around. Um, again, here, the you know, just the power of uh, flexible furniture. You can see here, these, these are a bit more traditional and that you still have um, a lot of the classroom boxes, but then you have, you know, this one where you have complete transparency. And so these two rooms can come together and become one big room. And I think um, as Thomas was talking about the, the challenges of, of change management, um, I think often, you know, when you are working with a school and you're you're trying to draw out from them what is their strategy just in simple terms what are they trying to do and how are they going to do it um, often you'll find there is a struggle um, to make a big change so there are ways that you can do things incrementally over time where you might still have more of the boxes but you have this you know these two rooms have a, a folding wall in between and these um openings can fold up so the wall completely disappears. And so maybe they're not using it that way immediately upon moving in. And there's some professional training that needs to happen to help that evolve. And then uh, you have a path where um, you're, you're able to do it over time. You're not demanding that it happens overnight. So here are just more um, images of schools. I wish I had gone to. My schools were not like this, but just like a lot of a lot of flexibility giving you that, that empowering you with that choice. Um, so you learn how you learn best and you take that with you um, forever. It, learning isn't just limited to your time in school. And so just sharing some renovation projects. Um, a lot of these images were buildings um, that were not schools and then they were transformed into schools. Um, so these, you know, like there's this connection to the outdoors is a really strong thing here for early childhood, but also um, at the high school level. Um, and so really using, um, as, as Rachel was saying, we're attached to the outdoors naturally because we're humans. And so that's a low hanging fruit when we have all these older buildings that really don't have a connection to the outdoors and they don't program the outdoors to be used of how you can um, use that it costs less money to develop the outdoors and the indoors. Um, and just simple things like making sure you have um, natural daylight to be connected to the outdoors. And so here's um, a, a project in Silicon Valley. This is what this room used to look like. Uh, you know, not a fun place to be uh, with your standard uh, drop ceiling and fluorescent lights and no connection to the outside. Um, and now here it is a much more dynamic space uh, filled with light and a strong connection to the outdoors. Um, and same project, here's the before, just you know, a kind of rabbit hole of cubicles and offices. And here it's opened up and always, you know, when you open up a space, you have to really think about the acoustics, the old um, you know, traditional drop ceiling isn't going to be enough if you really want to make it work so that people can do different activities in the same space. Um, and also there's the opportunity with that to bring in some materials that really make it warm, uh, you know, make it feel like a home away from home. Like you were saying, uh, Alexander, you, it, you know, you feel like kids probably would not want to leave these kind of spaces and that's our goal because you do spend a lot of time in school and it should feel like home for you to feel comfortable and safe, ready to learn. Um, so here are some other examples. Um, this is also uh, previously an office building and now it's used for education, um, you know, investing some 
funds into the outdoors to make these outdoor spaces. And this is our office in, in San Antonio, which was also basically a fixer upper and now um, a very dynamic space in which um, we practice the same things we hope our K-12 clients do. A, a lot of um, team teamwork and this um, sense of belonging and that we're all part of something and, and helping each other if there's anything challenging, um, we can take it on by collaborating, small group, large group, um, really, um, you know, help helping each other, which is really the same thing that um, school should be about. And just some more um, examples of office buildings, um, you know, converted into spaces uh, where people can come together. So um, that's what I had to share. Thank you. Mariana, I'm really impressed. So much inspiration. And it's it's so wonderful to look to your um, renderings and live photos and also the transformation from old one. It's black and white and now inspiring, colorful, cozy. It's, it's really cool. And it's like home. Um, so at home you have, when you want to sleep, you go to, to the sleeping room and it's really cozy. When you want to yeah, relax a little bit, you go to the living room. Then if you want to cook, you go to the kitchen, then you go outside to the garden. And so you're also in school, you have the different possibilities. If you want to relax, you can, you have places for that. If you want to focus, if you want to learn in groups, other spaces, so, so much possibilities that is a completely other world than the old fashioned classrooms. So I, I want to go to school again, I think. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, that, that's really nice. Thanks, thanks a lot for, for, uh, for, for sharing this insight. And I have a question um, for you. Um, what are some ways to target the duration between renovations so minimal investment is required in the future? Yeah, so I think um, a way to do that is you need to work with the school community um, to really uh, work together to make this change. You need you need people to be on board, and um, they may not be uh, comfortable with going too far. So there's a way to do it where you're you're doing things like I was talking about the raised floor that's going to give you flexibility for the future. Um, even if they're not team teaching today, you could say, well, let's connect some rooms together because in the future, you might not have one teacher to 25 students. You might have two to 50 and it affords the opportunity for cross-disciplinary learning. Um, and more of a connection to the outdoors because even if you know a lot of teachers are not yet comfortable with having students outdoors, they feel like there might be chaos or it's harder to control. And it's like getting them to, let go of that control and trust that the students are curious. And if the space is working with what the vision is of the school, there is a way to give them more freedom and make the most of the outdoors. So it's really like having this flexibility of extending the footprint of the traditional classroom until maybe someday the classroom goes away, like maybe even using um, demountable partitions like we do in workplace design where you can completely remove a wall and reconfigure a whole space, that would be the smartest thing to invest in is those kind of things that allow you to just make minor investments as you move forward instead of like having to tear down a building because it's so obsolete and you know the walls are made of masonry and there, there's you know it's it's not worth it to remodel it. You just want to start over. Yeah, thanks. So there are different, I think different possibilities. One possibility in the past was building walls around, build a prison. Now you, you have glass transparency or flexible walls to, uh, to uh, split or to, to bring classrooms and spaces together. Or you have the possibility also with curtains. Um, and then I come back to you, Thomas, to do Louise Lund. The whole concept of the building is also made with, with curtains. So you have open space or you can yeah, you, you can split a little bit in an acoustic way. And in, in Louis Nunn, what was the biggest surprise in the process? 
The biggest surprise was uh, people often assume that uh, younger members of the staff uh, will be the ones to embrace the future. We were surprised uh, at how many of the older members of the staff nearing the end of their careers committed to the process. Uh, they were delighted to finally have this freedom and to be able to take advantage of these opportunities. Uh, some had been dreaming of it for their entire work lives. Okay, so and um, in preparation of this session, you you said to me now you 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 don't uh, you you uh, was involved in the concept development, but now you are moving to Luisenlund for three weeks. Um, in the, when when the process is starting and the school is starting, and um, that's really amazing. And is the development of Louis Nun and the move to the new building completed? Or what do you think, how long does it take? No, not yet. The development starts when we move in. Uh, we'll be embracing many new experiences, changing things, adapting processes, uh, and uh, taking advantage of the flexible learning spaces. It's going to be really exciting. Yeah, I also think so. So, Thanks a lot for the insights to Louis Lund, and I'm looking forward to visit uh, Louis Lund um, uh, when it's ready and you have your experience. Um, I'm looking forward. So, Rachel, um, come back to the round. I have um, yeah two questions for you. And um, what happens um, if the environment does not meet the needs of its students? Does that happen? Yeah, that happens a lot. And um, if it doesn't meet the needs of the students, that's where it makes them feel uncomfortable or restricted and like they don't belong. And so their brain will remain in that fight or flight that I talked about. And they will be in this heightened um, awareness state where they're paying attention to everything else but the in-depth learning. And so um, it, that's where we, I talked about um, creating those spaces that are identity safe. So people feel like they're, I, identity is um, part of the school and that they're um, they're able to feel comfortable with it in it. Mm -hmm. And how can the learning environment support belong belongingness for diverse students? Yeah, um, with so many diverse students, that's where it goes back to a lot of the options and having choice and agency for students, having structured choice so that it meets um, students where they are, but also embedding um, multicultural symbols and um, principles kind of within the curriculum and the environment so students see themselves reflected in the building. Um, and then something else that's also really important that Ariana talked about was also design that exhibits students work with transparency. So allowing them to see through the corridors, to see students, to feel connected and part of community versus feeling siloed. Um, again, when we block students off into a classroom and tell them, don't look outside, don't look at nature, don't see other students, their distraction is trying, is they're trying to find anything that allows them to break away from um, that immediate um, classroom. And so something else is, that I talked about with place attachment is um, we want the school to be students' favorite place. If that's where we form the greatest attachment, we need to implement those things that students love, the nature, the play. Um, it needs to become their favorite place. Yeah. And if they say, oh, I want to go to school, it's much more nicer that at home than you did everything right. Yes. And it helps the parents. <laughs> <laughs> I want to go to school tomorrow. <laughs> yes. Um, Mariana, a question for you. Um, if there are careers that don't exist yet, how can we plan labs to make them work for this unknowns? Yeah, I think it, it's always um, smart to, you know, use a high base space. There might be something coming in that requires uh, more height, more volume in the space. Um, I think the raised floor uh, is always a good move. It, it's, it's a little bit more of an investment up front, but I think it'll pay off later when you have to renovate. Um, having ultimate flexibility with the infrastructure, like things, come, power coming down from the ceiling, also just good for you know safety and avoiding tripping hazards. Um, 
And when I worked with um, science teachers, uh, some are a bit set in their ways and want, you know, fixed um, fixed tables for everything. But there's a way to have a bit of both, like having, you know, the the millwork on the perimeter, but then keeping the center open and having um, tables that that can, um, you know, be like a peninsula up against the perimeter but not like another piece of casework that's fixed and really locks you into that space being that way um, for a long time. It would be a major remodel to like tear up a lot of millwork. So more, uh, a lot of reliance on, um, you know, furniture, fixtures and equipment really being flexible and mobile. Okay, thanks, and Marina. How much more does it cost to add things like a, raised access floor in a new building to be able to shift the electrical and data as is done in workplace tenant improvement projects yeah that you know that is a substantial number i uh, i worked on a project i think it was like 15 percent more but it was a five-story building and for a high school so we had you know uh you know this new building it was like ultimately the most flexible building on the campus and it fed into that district's um, design guidelines for future buildings that you know they it, it we made it work you know for a while uh, in design it was hanging out there as like that might be the first thing on the chopping block to go away if we're over budget um, but we managed to make it all fit in and I think uh, maybe we also spent less money building a lot of walls and other things so that we were able to put the money into that move that we all felt, you know, the client uh, agreed that that was a very smart move for future flexibility. Yeah. You know, building's going to last 50, you know, 50 years or so. Uh, you you want to not have to keep um, investing in, in it a lot as things go along. You want to maintain it and reconfigure it, right? Yeah. That, that's great. Um, I think smart investments, not building walls for, for much, much um, money. So flexible and, and smart curtains or flexible walls. So you don't have to reinvest in the future because you're flexible. This is a good um, way to do it. And you showed some examples, um, an existing building, a new building is is, is great for architects uh, designing a new building, but the a, a big challenge is transforming an old building, perhaps an office building or another kind of building to a learning, great inspiring learning space. And how can we teach an old building new tricks in your opinion? Well, well I, I think a lot of that again is um, there, there are a lot of building, you know, I'll speak to, you know, specifically where I do a lot of work in California. Um, we have what we call finger buildings. They're just narrow buildings that are classrooms that have an outdoor uh, courtyard. You know, the space in between them can be seen as a courtyard or a garden. And for a long time, um, you know, before research was made more accessible and evident and it came out, it was thought, you know, students should not be looking out the window. They should be focused on the teacher and focused on the lesson. And so we have these high windows that are Clara's story. Um, and on the other side of it is this beautiful outdoor space. And so we've been doing a lot where we use that structure that's existing, the beam um, for the Clara story and just pull, pull it down and make that whole area um, glass, a sliding glass door and a fixed slider. And now the teacher can see students go outside and we do landscape design where we create some, some boundaries. It's not a wall, but just something that gives a behavioral cue to the student like, hey, you have the freedom to go out here, but don't go beyond that you know, circular bench area or the hedge or whatever that element is that defines the space where they need to stay so that the teacher can still be supervising them from the inside. So um, I think that's one of the biggest low hanging fruit is like we really need to get kids outdoors more. And often you have something like that where there's an existing structure and you can just use that structure and replace a solid wall with, with transparency to the outside. Um, and then the other is when you have those double loaded corridors, um, those walls in between the columns are not load bearing. And so that's really easy to remove some of those 
And like in the examples I was showing, there were some spaces that were like, used to be two rooms across from each other divided by a hall. Now they're like one big room or one big commons, I should say, that the other classrooms can use also. And there's transparency from the, the classrooms that are adjacent to it to use it as an extension. So often, um, you know, we have projects where it's a district that has a, a declining population and they have actually too many classrooms. Um, and so, you know, I would say instead of going the route of consolidating schools and shutting down schools, it's like just use more space in the schools, um, give the students that space because you can't have the flexibility if you don't have enough space, right? You, you, you have all this furniture that you want to move around. If you just cram all of that into a traditional room, there's no there's nowhere to move it. It's just going to stay where it is, even if it's lightweight and flexible. So you, you need more space and more connection to the outdoors. Okay, thanks a lot. So thanks to you three, um, Mariana, Rachel, and Thomas for so much inspiration. I'm re really uploaded and I'm, mm -hmm. I'm full. I learned a lot from from your impulses, and that's really great so much inspiration, tips and tricks. And also the audience, I hope you learned a lot from our educational pro. So, and if you have questions or another thing, please contact us or directly, um, Rachel, Mariana or, or Thomas. Um, I think they can yeah, support you with your visions. And um, if you miss a live event or if you say, hey, this live event was so good, um, we have recorded this session. We will bring it online next or latest in, in two weeks. So you can forward that to your colleagues, to friends, to visionaries of education. Um, if you missed a live event in the past, like Global STEM Labs, Wellbeing Labs, or Innovation Center or, or something, it's on YouTube channel or on our website. You can watch this. And our next Lab Cafe will start on the 8th of February. It's about Roche Accelerator, Business Booster for Breathtaking Ideas, a great future project. And the brand new Roche Accelerator in Shanghai will open their doors in February in two or three weeks. And we will have a pre-look behind the concept, the architecture, and a lot more with the responsible people. I'm really excited. And the Roche Accelerator, the in-house accelerator from um, Roche, um, they already did some prizes for, for the concept and we will talk with the responsible people. I'm also excited about that. I hope you enjoyed our session. Thanks a lot for joining us and then have a nice day. Thanks a lot to you all. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.